Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening at our ACOE Legacy Panel. My name is Pam Schwartz and I'm the Chief Curator of the Orange County Regional History Center here in Orlando, Florida. This panel is being produced uh, in, uh, along with our Yesterday This Was Home, the ACOE Massacre of 1920 exhibition. This exhibit has been in, underway for almost three years, uh, but has the work began much, much longer than that ago. We've been open and we will be open through February 14th of 2021. I'd like to take a moment uh, to say a few words of thanks before we begin the panel. First of all, I know we have several individuals who are uh, attending this panel virtually. Also, thank you everyone for bearing with us with the fact that this is virtual given this year. Uh, we are sort of a hybrid of in-person and virtual uh, for our panelists and we will wish the best uh, for how that works. But we do know that we have several people who are very important that are in the audience and attending tonight. These are descendants of the individuals and the black families who survived or lived lived past and through Ocoee uh, at the time of the Ocoee massacre. And we wanna thank them for joining us and we wanna thank them um, just for being them and for doing oral histories with us and for participating in our exhibition. We'd also like to thank Florida Humanities for their generous support of all of the programming of the Ocoee exhibition, uh, this event as well as all of the others that we have coming up. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to introduce our people who are in person first. Uh, first of all, we have State Representative Geraldine Thompson. Uh, State, Geraldine Thompson uh, State Representative Geraldine Thompson was elected in 2018 as the first woman and first person of color to represent Florida House District 44. She previously served in the Florida House and in the Florida Senate and for 24 years as an administrator at Valencia College where she established the College Reach Out program which enabled thousands of students to fulfill their dream of going to college. She is also a respected community historian, author of Black America, Orlando, Florida, and founder of the Wells Built Museum of African American History and Culture. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Next, in person on our panel, we have Ms. Francina Boykin. Francina is a founding member of the Democracy Forum's Ocoee Massacre Research Project, which in the late 1990s made significant research discoveries about this event, including the location of lynching victim July Perry's grave. The research from this group, as well as from Francina, are the foundations and the very core of the exhibition you can come and see today at the History Center. She's been featured in film documentaries and numerous panels about the Ocoee Massacre, race relations, and also civil rights. Honored with the Marvin C. Zanders Humanitarian Award in 2006, she is also the 2020 recipient of the Historical Society of Central Florida's Donald A. Cheney Award for her long-standing dedication to Central Florida history and to community service. Thank you, Francina, for joining us. Good evening. Virtually, uh, we have State Senator Randolph Bracey. Uh, State Senator Randolph Bracey III of ACOE has represented District 11 in the Florida Senate since 2016. He also served in the Florida House from 2012 to 2016, representing District 45. Senator Bracey sponsored the 2020 Florida law designed to ensure that the ACOE massacre of 1920 was included in Florida school history curriculum, as well in state museum exhibits and programming. He holds degrees from the College of William and Mary in Virginia and the University of Central Florida. Thank you, Senator Bracey. Thank you. And last, but definitely not least, Dr. Paul Ortiz. Paul Ortiz is the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and professor of history at the University of Florida in Gainesville. His 2018 book, An African American and Latinx History of the United States, has been called one of 10 books about race to read instead of asking a person of color to explain things to you. He's also the author, excuse me, he's also the author of Emancipation Betrayed, The Hidden History of Black Organizing and White Violence in Florida from Reconstruction in the, to the Bloody Election of 1920, a winner of the Florida Historical Society's Harry and Harriet T. Moore Award. Without further to do, uh, again, thank you so much for all of our panelists. We're so looking forward to talking with you. We are going to uh, go ahead and ask a series of questions and ask the panelists to give forth their knowledge and their thoughts about this topic. Uh, I wanna provide just a very brief background on the Ocoee Massacre. Many of you have possibly heard this story, 
But one of the hardest and most difficult parts of talking about this is how many versions of the story, how much misinformation, how much good information is out there, but also the lack of documentation. A lot of different things were happening in Florida and across the nation that allowed something like the Ocoee Massacre to happen here. The events took place between November 2nd to 3rd, 1920, in Ocoee, Florida. A man by the name of Moses Norman, a black man from Ocoee, tried to uh, exercise his right to vote and was turned away from the polls. There are many versions and a lot of details in between here and there, but at the end of the night, the community of Ocoee had been largely burned to the ground an unknown number of black Ocoians had been murdered, others injured, many fleed, never to return, others stayed for a while and tried, uh, but after about six years, the community was all largely white once again. July Perry is lynched, Moses Norman does escape, and there's a lot more to that story. That is a very, very brief overview just so everyone knows uh, where we're headed in this conversation. But to start, I'd like to know from each of the panelists, each of you, uh, uh, Representative Thompson, if you would like to start, what first, how did you first learn about the Ocoee Massacre? What got you interested in this topic? Well, I have been interested in African American history for a very long time. I admired Frederick Douglass, who uh, wrote a newspaper that was called the North Star. He was an abolitionist and he was uh, very involved in documenting the lives of African American people. And so when I went to college at the University of Miami, my major, I had dual majors uh, in education and in African American history. And when I came to Orlando, one of the people that I talked to was a pastor uh, named Fred uh, Maxwell. And he talked about uh, the massacre in Ocoee. And I began to do research and to uh, do documentation. I think there are uh, two ways to approach this. You can learn about something and become interested, or you can be interested and then find the information yourself. And so I was invited uh, to join the reconciliation task force that was operating in Ocoee, and Ms. Uh, Boykin was a part of that. Uh, and I learned even more then about the story of the Okoye Massacre and July Perry. What about you, Francina? I was invited by a great friend of mine, a childhood friend. Her name was Diana Mitchell. Uh, it was 22 years ago. She invited me to attend a meeting. She didn't tell me what it was about. She just told me she thought I would be interested. And little did I know that this would become uh, almost a lifelong project. Uh, the group was Democracy Forum. And all my life growing up in Apopka, all I ever knew was that you didn't go to Okoye, you know, stay away from Okoye. And when I learned that um, the group had come together, that is when I first learned what tragedies had occurred in Okoye. Um, I was somewhat floored and I was in and it has been a journey that has taken me in many areas. Democracy Forum in 1998 after two almost a year and a half of research unveiled uh, to Okoye citizens our research which consisted of very key documents. One was July Perry's death certificate. Others were the U, uh, U.S. Census list, as well as a letter from uh, Annie Hamater describing what had happened. Democracy Forum uh, organized after a young man, young black man, had quit a job in Okoye at the uh, local radio station and came back and said that Okoye was not a place for a brother. And so Curtis Michelson, our founder of Democracy Forum, thought he would dig into it, and here we are now, 22 years later. And we're just so elated to know that this project has been embraced and the labor that went into making it possible for uh, us to research and honor the victims. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Senator Bracey, what about you?
I think you're muted. This is going to happen. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. When I was elected to uh, the state legislature, I remember I had a, a, a volunteer older woman who uh, supported my candidacy. And I told her I was moving my office to the city of Ocoee and she couldn't believe it. And so she started to tell me the history of Ocoee. She said to this day, she didn't, she doesn't go to Ocoee because she remembers it was a sundown town. And so as I started to talk to some of the older members of this community, uh, they told me about the history of Ocoee and, and it sparked my interest. And I started to research it myself and that that uh, inspired me to put forth the bill that I did last year. But but it was it was uh, it started a couple of years ago when I got elected. Great. And Dr. Ortiz. I first arrived in Leon County, Florida in the summer of 1994. In the wake of the testimonies given by survivors of the Rosewood massacre. And the entire state was on, on historical fire. People wanted to talk about what had happened in Rosewood. And here I was a graduate student at Duke University doing oral histories with African-Americans. And I really, I didn't know it at the time, but I really began the project that would become my dissertation and then later the book, Emancipation Betrayed, because I hadn't been in Florida for more than three or four months and doing archival research when I came across this statewide movement of African-Americans to regain the right to vote, that they began organizing in World War I. And it involved many people that, that listeners and viewers tonight will be familiar with. Uh, the movement was led by people like Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune, James Weldon Johnson, Walter White, Emma Collier actually in Orlando, um, African-American women organizers, uh, also organizing for women's suffrage amendment at the time, black men returning from combat in France determined to regain their citizenship rights. And there's a tremendous amount of violence that white people uh, and the state and uh, sheriffs and, and police instituted against black Floridians to try to stop the statewide voter registration movement in the weeks leading up to the 1920 election. Um, white people assassinated many African-Americans. Some of them were gunned down at courthouse uh, steps, but it became apparent that the epicenter, the most sustained anti-Black violence was occurring in Orange County, in Western Orange County, in a town called Ocoee. And at the time I hadn't set foot in Ocoee, but the Ocoee story, the anti-Black Election Day massacre was in the New York Times, it was in the Washington Post, it was in international media. And so what's remarkable, what was remarkable to me about the story as a younger historian was that this was an, Okoye was an international story. And it happened in the middle of a whole series of anti-Black massacres and pogroms designed to crush Black political and economic gains. And you start with East St. Louis anti-Black massacre of 1917, all the way to Rosewood in 1923. And Okoye's right in the middle of that. And so the story was just so incredibly compelling. And I was so blessed in my life to be able to be kind of welcomed in um, and mentored by people like Francina Boykin, uh, Curtis Michelson. Uh, the Democracy Forum invited me to Ocoee for the first time in the late 90s. Um, and it was just really a humbling experience to be with people so dedicated to trying to tell the truth against tremendous odds. Great, thank you. So. Everybody has sort of come to this event in a little bit different way and at a little bit different of a time. If you were to think back to those earliest days of your learning about this event, again, some of that is further back for uh, some than others, and to what you know about this event now or what your feelings are now at this point in time, would you say that your perception of the event has changed? Or what is, one, what is the single thing that you find or have learned or have found most surprising, I guess you will say, about your research or knowledge of the event? And I'd love to have everybody answer this again. Uh, Dr. Ortiz, if you wanna take that first, we'll kind of just go in reverse order. Well, I think that, you know, for, for so many years, I mean, the phrase sundown towns um, has been mentioned. And I was on the radio interview earlier today and I argue that 
this nation is a haunted place because there are literally hundreds, probably thousands of sundown towns. Uh, the United States is a nation uh, full of anti-Chinese, anti-Mexican, anti-Black, anti-Jewish pogroms. Um, what's unique about Ocoee, though, it's interesting, there are not as many sundown towns in the Deep South as there are, for example, in the Midwest. And what strikes me going back to Ocoee, and remember, I'm an outsider. You know, I live in Gainesville. Most of my life, though, I lived in, on, on the West Coast. What surprises me is, um, I guess not surprises me, but what strikes me is the courage that a small group of people have had over a long period of time. And now I'm thinking of, again, the Democracy Forum uh, and others who tried to tell the story as honestly as they possibly could against tremendous odds. Because for many years, and many and people from Akoi shared this with me, um, if you try to tell the story in the 1950s or 60s or 70s, um, you were essentially dissuaded from doing so. It was not to be talked about. But you can imagine the, the pressures, um, because again, I wanna emphasize that nothing that happened in Ocoee is secret. It was heavily publicized. You can read the Orlando Sentinel. In fact, the Sentinel was quite um, uh, uh, fond of telling the story of the anti-Black massacre, the Miami Herald, the Florida Times Union, uh, uh, the governor of the state, Sidney Katz, was quite proud of this event. Northern congressmen, when the NAACP went before the U.S. House Census Committee in 1920, uh, Walter Pickens, the best lawyers that the NAACP could field, argued the case about black voter suppression in Ocoee and Jacksonville and Miami and other parts of Florida. And the House Census Committee, the response and remember, most of these are Northern congressmen. And this is the most powerful congressional committee. This is a census year. It has the power to apportion congressional representation, federal resources. And the US Constitution is clear. If a state is involved in the violation of citizenship rights, a state can be penalized and can lose congressional representation. And so I guess what surprised me about this case was to understand that, that while it was a local anti-Black massacre, in many ways led from, from people from uh, white supremacists from all over the region, the federal, the national implications of this event were so stunning because the federal government and Congress, US Congress had a responsibility to do something about this months after it had happened. They had a responsibility to actually go to the state of Florida and say, you messed up, you violated the US Constitution. But instead, the members of the Census Committee, most of the Northerners said, well, we don't support Negroes voting. We don't want them voting in Chicago or New York. Why would we support them voting in Florida? So it was a wake up call for me. It must have been an atrocious wake up call for African Americans in 1920 to realize that they had just fought in this major war they had just fought in World War I, and they were, they were being so dishonored and so disrespected. And so I guess the surprising thing to kind of wrap up, and I, I could talk about this forever, I apologize, I, just get, I get kind of worked up, is how willfully ignorant the majority society has continued to be about Ocoee. And it isn't just Ocoee, it's Tulsa, 1921, it's East St. Louis, 1917, it's Chicago, 1919, it's Longview. And it's Elaine, uh, Arkansas, 1919. So what makes Ocoee distinct is also what connects it to racial oppression, the history of racial oppression in the society. It's a story that should be told in every school district in this state. And the exciting thing is that now, thanks to uh, Senator Bracey uh, and other you know, courageous political leaders and community historians, we're finally in the cusp of making this a required topic. Every school child in the state should know the Akoi story by sixth grade. Thank you. That's excellent. Uh, so well, that'll segue straight to then Senator Bracey. What about you? What, uh, what really has surprised you or sort of uh, struck you about what you've learned about Akoi uh, since you first knew of it? Well, if we're talking about the massacre, I would just say that I would say the state's role 
and how they deputize the mob. And uh, you wouldn't think uh, a government representative of the people would have a role in, uh, in, in, in inflicting pain on, on black citizens and being a part of this massacre. Uh, I think if you look at the, the local courts in Orange County at the time and how they maneuvered to transfer the property shortly after the uh, massacre. So, you know, I guess government's role uh, is what surprised me a little bit. And then really just, if you look at the connections to voter suppression, even today, a hundred years later, I think that when you look at Florida's history of voter suppression, uh, it's not surprising to see even, even the tactics that we're seeing today in our society. There does seem a seem to be a haunting amount of relevancy from a hundred years ago uh, to today, doesn't there? And I think sometimes the role that is played is also as much the role that wasn't played and should have been. Francina, would you like to take that question? Oh, will you repeat it again? <laughs> um, what has, in, in all the years you've been looking at this event, learning about it, talking to people, is there something in particular that has really surprised you or struck you about the information that you've learned? I, will, I, I would say the, si <clears throat> the silence in the black community that people did not talk about what had happened. Growing up, when I first learned that something was not just right with the Okoye was when we would be on a school bus uh, traveling to events on the west side of town, uh, Winter Garden area mainly, uh, because I attended Philly Sweetly School, and we were rivalries with Drew High School in Winter Garden. So the bus, school bus driver to and from events uh, would take a shortcut, or really wasn't a shortcut. It was around the north perimeter of Okoy, and would say, shh, be quiet, be quiet. We're going around Okoy. And what I thought then, was that it was, Okoy was just a place, you know, a city for white people and that black people were just not allowed. I did not know why uh, the fear was, and I don't think anyone as students, uh, children, nobody ever said why. But 22 years ago at Borders Books, you know, it was a very intense moment for me I was the first person to arrive at the Borders Books after a week of getting calls, uh, wanting to cancel the event. Democracy Forum was ready to unveil our research. And I arrived at the event. I was the first person to arrive. And so I took a place in the corner. I was very nervous at that time. I was beginning to question myself as to what had I gotten myself into? Was I really ready for this? And only moments later, I watched the mayor of Okoy, Scott Vandegriff, charge through the door, and I'm like, oh, I wanted to slump down in my seat. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, but I was the first person to the podium uh, that day, and there were citizens from Okoy who were saying that Democracy Forum had no right to be ex you know, exploiting their city uh, that we had no credibility, we didn't know what we were talking about, but what we were asking basically is that, you know, what are you gonna do about what, what happened 70, at that time it was 78 years ago, after the discovery of July Perry's grave site in the Greenwood Cemetery, uh, Curtis and myself, uh, we like, you know, this is like one of those where you laid him moment, uh, that we found his grave. Now we had this evidence that something did happen. And so since that time, 22 years ago, it has been a, it has become my life. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. That's a little more background to again, uh, how this exhibition even, uh, even became possible for the History Center. Uh, Representative Thompson, what about you? Is there something that's particularly struck you or stuck with you? Well, what has stuck with me is the willingness of people today to discuss it. Uh, as you've already heard, African-Americans 
uh, didn't want to discuss it. They had been traumatized. Uh, seeing the body of July Perry hanging and left there for days, used for target practice uh, as a means of intimidating other people who might think of voting. So they were traumatized, and any time that there's that kind of pain, people want to forget. And so it was very difficult to get the information from members of the African American community. One of the people that I talked to, and this is the way you have to get the history, is going to the primary resources. And one of the people that I talked to was Lester Dabbs, who was former mayor of the city of Ocoee. And he had the courage to talk about the massacre of 1920. And when he did his graduate work at Stetson, his master's thesis uh, was focused on the massacre in Okoye. And even with his courage, he didn't really want to totally own what happened. And so in his thesis, he points out that yes, some people in Okoye were responsible and involved, but in fact, it was people from outside of Okoye who, when they learned that two white men had been shot after they went to July Perry's home, they came into the colored quarters and they were the ones responsible. So still there was that distance. So I guess what surprises me uh, and encourages me today is that there is a willingness to talk about it, uh, to reclaim this history that has been obscured and ignored and now to say that it's going to be part of our curriculum because if we're gonna say that black lives matter, they have to matter in our educational system. They have to be in our books. They have to be part of the curriculum, the lesson plans, the learning materials. Absolutely, and I'm gonna come back to that thought. I did want to uh, just say for everybody who's viewing this presentation, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will keep some time for questions uh, at the end that are coming direct, uh, directly from the individuals who are viewing. So if you can just uh, drop those in the chat or in the question and answer box, those will get passed over. We might not have time to address them all, uh, but please do ask your questions. We wanna know what you wanna know about this event and about each of uh, our panelists' experiences around it. So, Representative Thompson, coming back to what you were just saying, um, you're a member of Florida's Commissioner of Education's African American History Task Force. And the, the bill that, that Senator Bracey put forth uh, with the successful passage of House Bill 1213 that will lead to educating about the Ocoee Massacre in our classrooms. Could you talk to me a little bit about the, the task force and what it's doing and how it's starting to try to, uh, to tackle this, this new opportunity? Well, the task force has existed uh, for more than 20 uh, years. It is part of state statute that um, teachers must instruct students on the history of African Americans and the history of the Holocaust. That was put in Florida statute in 1992, and it is not being done. The task force has visited the 67 counties, and we're not talking about events because sometimes when we ask people, what are you doing uh, in terms of providing instruction on African-American history, we're told, well, we celebrate Dr. King's birthday. An event is not instruction. So you have 67 counties where the instruction is not taking place. And so the task force now has been charged to come up with the curriculum to provide the content to the 67 counties to make sure that this is taught. Uh, this is a House bill, because when the bill came from the Senate, uh, I offered an amendment uh, to a bill that had been offered by Representative Randy Fine to teach the history of the Holocaust. And so I, since it had to do with instruction, I offered the amendment to add the history of the Okoye massacre and African-American history, because even though it's been on the books for, uh, since 1992, it has not been done. Well, we have a lot of work to do yes. then, <laughs> then, don't we? Um, so, so kicking off to you um, then, Senator Bracey, um, in the exhibit, we talk about Okoye, we talk about other events like this, such as Rosewood. Now, um, 
a big difference between Ocoee and Rosewood is that the, the survivors and the descendants of Rosewood um, and the victims did actually receive uh, some form of compensation uh, in, turn, in return to sort of what had happened to them. Um, that is not the case with Ocoee. Uh, would you like to, to sort of maybe speak to some of your thoughts uh, when it comes to the conversation of reparations? Sure. I I think that it's difficult to have a conversation about the Okoye massacre and not talk about reparations. Uh, I, I saw recently where the land that was held by July Perry and other black members of Okoye is worth over nine million now. Uh, they weren't compensated, and, and so I, I don't. So it's interesting. You have a, a an issue of voter suppression, but you also have land theft. You have government supported land theft. And that's exactly what it what it was. So originally, this bill had a, a reparations piece to it. And that was the original thought of it. And, and, and the education portion was something that was added on to it. But everyone knows that reparation is controversial for some folks. And so as I moved the bill forward, um, I had to take it out because of some of the leaders at, at certain chairmen, certain chairmen of certain committees would not hear the bill unless I took the reparations portion out. And so that was a reality of moving something like this through the legislature. But I was willing to take it out because I thought it still was important for it to be taught in schools and to memorialize it. Also a part of this bill is that, that it has to, uh, Orange County Public Schools has to look for naming opportunities um, in their current schools. The state, Secretary of State has to look for state facilities to, to name after. So all of these things, memorializing the event was important. I was willing to take that out. But in passing this bill and having members of the House and members of the Senate to hear the story, uh, I, I've had some feedback from even some Republican members in powerful positions, chairman, that said they're, they're open to conversations about reparation after learning about the story which a lot of members in the legislature just didn't know about it. So that was encouraging. And so that's something that I will continue to push for yeah, in this upcoming session. Knowledge is definitely sort of step one, which is what we're sort of seeing today with an exhibit and the, the education bill and also this. And you know, we've mapped, uh, the, the History Center has mapped all of these properties. We have an interactive map. We know that those properties that were owned by black landowners at the time of the massacre is worth well over $9 million. And we need to update those numbers because we've since found more properties. So I think that is a conversation, a conversation around reparations that will definitely, uh, definitely continue. Um, we do have a question. I'm going to just sort of open this one to the floor. A uh, question from uh, one of our attendees. Uh, can you talk about connections between the Ocoee massacre, which happened 100 years ago, uh, as of November 2nd and 3rd, that's next week, uh, voting, uh, voting in election day, uh, 100 years ago. Can you talk about the connections between the Ocoee massacre and present day voter suppression? How, uh, excuse me, how can we turn knowledge of the horror of this event into fuel to fight suppression of the black vote today? Is there anybody who'd like to speak to that question? Well, I uh, see the connection between what has happened with voting rights for former felons who have paid their debts to society, they've served their time, and the voters in the state of Florida overwhelmingly uh, put an amendment in the Florida Constitution that said they would get their voting rights restored. Florida was one of the few states in the nation that had this kind of permanent disenfranchisement of people who have had felony convictions. And the way that relates to uh, African Americans is that there have been studies that have proven that for the very same crime, African Americans got harsher penalties, longer times, things that might be a misdemeanor uh, if you were not black, would be a felony if you were black. Uh, so this is a way to keep a certain segment of our population from voting from participating in our democracy. And we have seen our governor appeal this all the way to a federal court in Atlanta using our tax dollars uh, so that African Americans would not be able to vote in this election in 2020. 
and now uh, our supervisors of elections are being asked to purge the roles of people with felony convictions, even though there's no database clearinghouse that shows who has and has not paid. So it's a matter of participation and uh, being first class citizens that was going on in 1920 and is going on in 2020 today. I would say, you know, you're talking about there's no clearinghouse. We as a History Center staff doing research, we were just trying to figure out how do you even know? You know, if you were somebody who has fines, what you've paid, and there, there isn't. It was really confusing for us to even try to wrap our heads around what could or could not be. Well, I tried uh, to find out for a couple of my constituents whether they had paid fines and fees. I would call the Department of Corrections who referred me to the clemency board, who referred me to the clerk of the court, and it was chasing a rabbit going around. So as I said, there is no particular place that you can go to determine if you have paid fines and fees. The Secretary of State does not have uh, this information. So you are disenfranchising people when the state itself cannot confirm whether they did or did not pay fines and fees. Uh, there was an, a, a bill that I had that required that this information be given to people as they uh, leave prison, and, and that bill or amendment was shut down. Um, I, I think the leadership, you talk about the governor, the, the Senate Republican leadership, House Republican leadership has no intention of making it easier for people to get this information to pay these fines and fees. You, you, you see that they are, are trying to put forth investigations on people like LeBron James and Michael Bloomberg that are paying these fines and fees. So it's clear that they're gonna do everything they can to stop returning citizens from voting. And I think there's a clear line of connection between uh, what's happening now and what happened when this, this law was implemented. We're talking about 152 years ago, shortly after slavery, this law was implemented so that these former slaves couldn't vote. And now you have present day leaders who are doing the same thing that people did 152 years ago. Um, the intentions are still the same to make sure these folks cannot vote. So voter suppression is real and it's happening right now. And did you hear the president say that uh, he's going to have monitors at the polls? This is another form of intimidation uh, so that people are, will be fearful uh, to go and exercise their constitutional right to vote. So while some things have changed since 1920, some things clearly remain the same. You know, one, one of the things, if I could add, what connects African-Americans in a COE and in a Western Orange County in 1920 to African-Americans in other parts of the South is the incredible strides that they had made in terms of economic progress uh, between the end of Reconstruction up into World War I. Uh, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, in a series of remarkable sociological studies, um, told the story of Black land ownership in states like Florida, Georgia, Mississippi. And he discovered that the rate of Black land ownership between 1900 and 1920 uh, had skyrocketed. Uh, you had many counties in, in the state of Florida the state that, by the way, had the highest per capita rate of anti-Black lynching, the highest per capita rate of anti-Black violence. And even there, African-Americans in Ocoee had really dug in and were successful to a, a really amazing uh, extent in purchasing their own farms, uh, running their own, and, and these were not big plantations, uh, but these were very important landholders that African-Americans all the way from places like Gadsden County, Alachua County, where I live now, uh, down to Central Florida. And again, I want to point out that voter suppression, I want us to remember the economic impacts of this. And this is why I think we have to discuss reparations now, because the Akoi Massacre was designed both by white ruling class people to destroy and 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 prevent African-Americans from voting, yes, number one, that's the number one goal. Equally related to that is the effort to keep black people as powerless and as close to slavery as possible, to keep them dependent, to take away their land, 
to take away their ability to farm independently, to turn them into peons, into convict laborers. That's what the state of Florida was involved in in 1920. I mean, the convict lease was very profitable. We talked today about private prisons, right? Well, back then the convict lease was even more profitable than private prisons are today. In Alachua County, um, I'm a member of the Alachua County Labor Coalition, and we worked really hard in Amendment 4. And the amazing thing to me about it, the Amendment 4 campaign was how many white people supported that, that, that amendment and how many people signed those petitions, uh, even supporters of Trump. Because when you put the case to the people and you said, look, these, the, the, these people who've been convicted of these crimes, um, they've done their time. You know, and we made the case, we, we gathered over 1 million signatures to support Amendment 4. This is one of the remarkable campaigns of modern American political uh, history. Think of that, 1 million signatures and broad-based public support, conservative, liberal, left, right, all sorts of people sign those petitions. And the fact that the state of Florida has fought so hard to undo the will of the people demonstrates the connections between the anti-Black election massacre in 1920 and voter suppression today. It's all about keeping Black people powerless, keeping people subservient, ensuring the control of the society by a small and dwindling amount of white wealthy people who understand that if Black working class people have the right to vote, then the day of that small white ruling class minority rule is over. And so this is a serious struggle. It's as serious now a struggle as it was in 1920. It's a struggle for democracy because that's what, what African-Americans in Ocoee were striving for. They were striving to do three things. One, to break through the barrier of white supremacy, to sweep it away. Number two, to dismantle the one party state, to bring about for the first time ever in Florida, a democracy. And number three, to provide for the economic security of their families. Uh, these were the stakes. And again, just as serious now as they were back in 1920. So Paul, I think actually uh, we had a few different questions from the, the, our, our uh, attendees, but I think he actually answered a, a few of those. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the event. We talked about the events leading up to the Ocoee massacre. We've talked about some of the, the things that are being done today. Um, one of the things I, I'd like to have uh, whoever would like to address it. Um, when we look at this really difficult history that happens, right? Sometimes people think that was Rosewood, that was over there, that was Tulsa. This is an event that happened somewhere at a different time. This is an event that happened here and still has a legacy for our community today, along with all of the other events of, of black suppression or, or racial terror that have happened. So what do you think is the best way of educating or starting to have these conversations in a community about the difficult past that has happened here? Uh, and instead of creating division, uh, like those conversations often do, what is a way we can go about this uh, that will rather help strengthen the internal community bonds? When Democracy Forum set out uh, with uh, the unveiling of our research, our, we wanted to educate the community. We held forums throughout Central Florida and to educate people about their rights to vote and what had happened to the citizens of Okoy when they voted. So, you know, voter suppression is a history that continued to repeat itself. And we all have a charge and that is to be committed to, you know, I think we need more voter education uh, of the people. You know, you, you register a person or people to vote, but, you know, we leave them there. <laughs> and when you leave them there, sometimes, you know, I've had several people just in this election says, Francine, you know, uh, these amendments, you know, what should I, you know, where should I vote? So that's not only with black people, that's people in general, that, you know, voter education is something that we should focus more on. Okay. Well, I would like to say that when we talk about reparations, I feel like we just have to have an honest and open conversation about it. Because when it's brought up, you know, it, 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 it puts people in their corners 
and they don't like to talk about it. But I think if you're going to really get to the heart of what happened and if there's going to be real reconciliation, I don't know how you don't talk about that. When you, t again, th this is much bigger than just a, 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 a voter suppression story. You've had land that was transferred over to members of the mob. And, and in a country like America, where we talk about our ideals and, and freedom and, and, you know, these different ideals that we hold so, so dear, how do we claim those ideals, but also we can't talk about what happened and how to repair these type of situations. I, I think this will be a ongoing struggle if we can't openly and honestly talk about uh, repairing people. We've done it. We've done it with all kinds of, of groups that have uh, that have been pro uh, persecuted. And so it's, it's time to have an honest conversation about about black people and what we've endured in this country and issue and, and incidences like the Okoye massacre, we can start one at a time to just, just deal with it. And so I don't think it needs to be a controversial issue. I don't think you can continually dismiss it and, and say, um, you know, that was a hundred years ago. Yeah, it was a hundred years ago, but their property was taken. What if your grandfather's property was taken? Do you think it's fair to dismiss, um, just, just dismiss it? And so the, these are documented incidences of land theft. And so that, that's what I think to have open and on, honest conversations. And for some reason, uh, that's difficult. And I don't mean to, to say it like that to push people in their corners, but until we're open about these, these conversations, uh, I think it's hard to get to the, to, to the heart of the matter. And one of the things that I think uh, we really have to talk about in terms of land is generational wealth. And if you consider uh, our economy, our lives as a relay race, and one generation hands the baton to the next, who hands it to the next, who hands it to the next, if you have land, you hand off the baton. If you don't have land, you have nothing to hand off. So uh, African Americans could not amass generational wealth because the land was taken. Uh, home ownership is the same kind of thing. So we are going to have to talk about that uh, when we talk about reparations. I offered a bill in the last legislative session to name a portion of Silver Star Road that comes through Okoye, the Julius July Perry Memorial Highway. And Senator Bracey uh, sponsored it in the Senate. It passed. And uh, the Florida Department of Transportation has erected one of the big brown uh, markers on uh, Silver Star. We're going to unveil that on November 7th, which will follow the last rites because July Perry was a very multifaceted man. Uh, he was a member of the Masonic Order, a member of the Lodge in Okoe, and the Masons uh, in Florida, the Worshipful Master uh, Prince Hall Order, they're going to do the last rites for July Perry, which he did not get at his grave site in uh, the Greenwood Cemetery here. And then we're going to invite people to come to Okoe for the unveiling of the sign. Now, what's important about that, uh, you heard Senator Bracey talk about naming opportunities. When you see those signs, you ask, well, who was that? Why is this person um, being honored here, recognized here? what made them significant. So this is a, a progressive kind of thing and the beginning of going back and unearthing uh, that history that has been buried for a very long time. There's a lot of work yet to be done. Um, I'm gonna ask just one more question and then we'll sort of start to wrap up. Um, sort of hand in hand with all of the things you've been discussing and things you've been saying, um, one of the things we leave people with after the, the end of the exhibit is that this is all really difficult content. It is a lot to think about and consider in the past, but thinking about the role that we each play in creating the history now. So 100 years from now, when some you know, curator is dissecting our stories, uh, what is it that they're gonna say about our time? 
about what we're doing or not doing, the Black Lives Matter movement and the legacies that all of these things are carrying. So I would ask each of you, um, what is a direct, what is one direct action that each individual living today in America uh, can take in working towards uh, racial equality? Well, I, I think we need to talk about uh, scholarships uh, for people who have uh, had limited access and who have had limited capital to fund college education. We need to be talking about health care uh, for people so that they live long and uh, vibrant lives. If they went to college, we need to talk about loan forgiveness. So when you say the word reparation, people imagine that you're talking about a stack of dollars that's going to be handed over to people. We're talking about something like the GI Bill, where people were given uh, certain amenities and, and uh, certain kind of advantages because of all of the uh, centuries of, of both slavery and segregation and land theft and, and the rest of it. So I think that as people now, we can begin to advocate for these things to make people whole. Francina? And for me, I would say that families or parents educating your children or teaching your children or sharing with your children their history, your history. Because, you know, I uh, agree with uh, State Representative uh, Thompson. You know, there are more ways that we can, say, give back. And one of those is our history is essential. And I am just so elated over the legislation passed this year that this curriculum will be taught in schools because Democracy Forum, we only wanted to educate the community and it looks like we've gone, we went beyond that. And so more and more groups when a uh, hundred years from now when they're coming through the pages like we, we had done with the research they said, oh, there was some people. One thought I would like to make mention was uh, Armstrong Hightower, who was alive when we were doing the research, he asked a reporter, what took y'all so long? And this was almost 100 years, you know, it was about 80 some years at that time. What took you so long to investigate what happened? He had been living with this agony and pain with no one to share with. So our history is essential. Thank you. Dr. Ortiz, final thoughts. Do we still have Dr. Ortiz? As parents and community members and engaged individuals, we need to be marching to our local school boards and demanding that the history of what African-Americans tried to do in 1920 to regain the right to vote, to make Florida democracy, and then equally the efforts by white ruling class people to crush those efforts, to steal the property of black people, to suppress their vote. We need to make sure the Coe story of 1920 is told in every school district in this state. And that's a charge I want to give and, and that, you know, uh, Senator Bracey and Representative Thompson have already given us and Francine has given us many, many times. I just want to amplify that. We have a responsibility, everyone joining in tonight. None of us were alive when these terrible events happened. Uh, and so we don't bear direct responsibility for what happened in 1920. But because we know the story now, we sure, oh, we have an enormous responsibility to make sure this story is told. It's the greatest civics lesson that you can offer. If, if someone asked me as a historian, why should we tell the Ekoi story? There are many reasons. Number one, out of respect for the survivors. But number two, this is the best possible civics lesson that you can teach a sixth grader. Why is voting important? What is democracy? What does it matter, right? We have over 50% of the people in this country who don't even bother to vote. And if they know the story of what happened, of what Black people had to sacrifice, not just in Ocoee, but in Tulsa, uh, during Reconstruction in Florida and other states, in the 1960s in Georgia, 
in Northern Florida, if they know these stories, they can no longer be ignorant and silent. They need to get, they, they need to get really active. In conclusion, for me, one of the inspiring stories is that, or happenings, is that the Black Lives Matter movement has opened grand new spaces to have candid discussions about history. If it has to wait, if you have to wait until you're 50 to learn the story of Akoi, well, it's great you know the story, but again, you should have been told the story many, many years earlier. Um, all across the country, we have major curriculum reform efforts. I'm working right now with the state of Connecticut to help reform that state's educational curriculum. Starting next year, every high school graduate of the state of Connecticut will study and take courses in African-American history, Latinx history, and Puerto Rican history. Not as electives, not as extracurricular activities, but as required subjects. We need to honor the work of the, of the Black and African-American History Task Force in Florida and do the same thing in Florida. We need to make these topics require topics. If we're gonna be serious about civics, civic engagement and democracy, let's teach the true story of democracy in the United States. Let's stop sugarcoating our history. A Coe, Rosewood have to be at the center of that, of that narrative. So as parents and, and, and concerned citizens, y'all, we have a lot of work to do. Some of it is trying to interact, you know, certainly being active with, with, with state, and federal government, but part of it is getting to the next, when, when is your next school board meeting? I'm just gonna open that up as a general question. When is your next local school board meeting? Get the, the material together that, that Pam Schwartz and others have been gathering, Francine and Boykin has been gathering for decades. Get that material together and bring it to your, your school board and demand that your local schools tell the story. That's the greatest, or one of the greatest tributes I think we can make to the victims of a COE in 1920. I'd also add that when you talk about the African American History Task Force, uh, they were given the responsibility to develop the curriculum and the lesson plans to get it out to 67 counties. They were given no money. So we pay lip service. Uh, I remember when I uh, started working on the Wells built, People said the building is old, it's dilapidated, it's in Paramore, it's blighted, there's a slum and uh, no resources. So what we've done, we've done because we felt that it was important without a lot of help. So if we really wanna do this, we have to put the resources there to enable it to happen. Amen. <laughs> you said it, Francina, so I didn't have to. Uh, <laughs> Senator Bracey, do you have final thoughts before we round up for the night? No, I would just encourage everyone to vote. This is what July Perry and those uh, who were killed or run out of their homes, wh why they died. They, they were fighting for a right to vote. And so we're right in the midst of it. I think you honor the legacy of July Perry and those killed in the Okoye massacre um, by voting. And I just would say to people just to be engaged. Um, myself, Representative Thompson, and others, we, we, we've run for office to fight for issues like this, but I think everyone can do something. And so that's up to you to figure out how you get engaged and not just this issue, but, but just important issues. Um, this one is important. Uh, it should be taught. Uh, you know, Dr. Ortiz mentioned our school boards. You know, a lot of the implementation of the bill that I passed uh, happens next year, but the school board can start to can decide to name a school at their next meeting. I mean, we, we can push our leaders to do more. And so I would just encourage everyone to find out what that more is for you and do it. I wanna thank this entire amazing and incredible panel, uh, not only for participating tonight, but for all of the work that you do <laughs> all of the time to pass these bills, to bring this story to light, to do the research, uh, and to have really have set the foundation again for the success of the History Center and being able to even build this exhibition. Um, we sort of stand on the shoulders of those before us in that uh, and appreciate you for all the work you are continuing to do. Uh, we hope that the people participating who've come to the panel tonight uh, take these words and think about them and, and put them into your own lives. Uh, I, I also want to thank again, uh, not only 
All of the families and descendants of those black families that were impacted by the events that happened in Ocoee on November 2nd and 3rd, 1920, that have been able to join us. But all of those we've not yet had the honor to meet. Um, it is really their story to tell, and we are so honored um, that we can bring this forth and, and do an exhibit and to try to bring greater visibility to this event. And we'd also again like to thank Florida Humanities for their generous support of this program and all of our others. Uh, please do check our website for upcoming events. Uh, the city of Ocoee will be having different events. There's a lot of different things going on over the next week because we are just days away from the 100th year remembrance of the events of the Ocoee massacre. If you have questions, you can reach out to the History Center. Please, if you can, we have time to ticket entry uh, to make sure to try to ensure for the safety of social distancing for our visitors. Try to come to the exhibit if you can. If not, keep track of our events and programming as we're hoping to do a virtual tour in the future. Thank you, thank you again to our panelists. We look forward to this as the start of more conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.